Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the SDG Action Zone. My name is Dauda Jabarte. I'm the global head of the UN SDG Strategy Hub. Today is a special day. It's the fourth anniversary of the adoption of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. What does that mean? It's the fourth birthday of the SDGs. So we can sing happy birthday later if we want. Um, today's been an absolutely packed session here in the Action Zone. We've ranged from conversations about transformative action uh, and examples from sport parliamentarians. We had an all-female parliamentarian and thought leader panel this morning. Um, yeah. Local authorities and cities making a declaration on how they're coming together to accelerate SDG implementation. We've talked to businesses, we've heard from businesses, thought leaders and activists, and technology. Uh, we're jumping into technology here uh, for obvious reasons, uh, including who's in the room. Um, and it's all really, really geared around how to get from incremental to exponential in terms of exactly what is needed to deliver the goals by 2030. Um, we'd love to express our appreciation uh, to Google.org as well as Project Everyone and a handful of other partners who helped enable this space. Uh, it's the first time that we are, we being the UN, are entering into and welcoming uh, at mass sessions like this. Uh, it was around transformative action. We wanted to bring multi-sectors to the action zone to talk about what it is that they're doing uh, and really, really, really driving things forward uh, and helping push and move the needle. Um, I would love to introduce uh, Ruth Porat, the Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer at Alphabet and Google. Welcome. Good afternoon, and thank you all for being here. In our first letter to shareholders back in 2004, Google's founders highlighted our goal which is to develop services that significantly improve the lives for as many people as possible around the globe. And that vision continues to guide all of us at Google. We are tech optimists, and we believe deeply in the potential for technology to have a profound positive impact across the world. And for each of us, our view is that leadership comes not just from what we do, but very importantly, from how we do it. And we are firmly of the view that the UN Sustainable Development Goals best have uh, the, the outline for what all companies should do to conduct themselves well. And at Google, we have a three-pronged approach to really deliver on this. One, it's about building for everyone. It's core to everything that we do. We're committed to making products that create opportunities for everyone around the world regardless of their location or circumstances. So wherever you are, you can have access the same way those of us here in New York City or San Francisco do. Number two, it's about operating responsibly. We work hard to ensure that our business operations align with the sustainable development goals. It's about operating in an environmentally sustainable way, upholding the best of possible uh, with our supply chain, it's about creating a truly diverse workforce in all of those with the utmost focus on human rights. And then third, it's very much about partnering with philanthropy. And we believe that meaningful progress on the sustainable development goals is only possible when people come together across sectors, and that's how we approach problem solving. Through Google.org, our philanthropy efforts, we're also committed to bringing Google volunteers and resources, both funding and technology, to innovative nonprofits that are solving the world's most complex, complex challenges. And you're going to be hearing more about that today. We're super excited about it. There's some great information on the walls here. You're also going to be hearing how Google is committed to ensuring that our day-to-day -day business footprint aligns with sustainable goals. Our sustainability initiatives are raising the bar and making smart use of the Earth's resources, expecting the highest ethical standards throughout our supply chain and creating products with people and the planet in mind. And whether we're partnering with UN Environment on an app to map the world's fresh water supply or help nonprofits find new ways to deploy emerging technologies like AI, we're committed to ensuring that technology 
is applied responsibly and promotes growth and opportunity for all. And that's why we are so proud to partner with governments and other leaders in civil society, international organizations, and other companies to really spur progress and collaborate on solutions. Now, it is my great honor to introduce an extraordinary leader who, through her career, has focused on the most pressing issues facing the planet, from climate change to poverty, from public sector reform and sustainable development. As she described it, it has been a long journey, step by step, using the education I had to make a difference, and what a difference she is making. So please join me in welcoming Deputy Secretary Amina Mohammed. Thank you very much. Your Majesty, Queen Rania of Jordan, friends, colleagues, because there's many in the audience I see that have been on this journey with us for quite a while, and it's such fun to be here talking about today AI. So welcome to the SDG Action Zone, and I'd like to thank Google for its role in making this event possible. Um, and as I was just speaking to Her Majesty, we were looking back on the work that we did together to shape the SDGs, because truly teamwork, and we never had this much engagement with business, um, talk less the world of tech, which then seemed so far away, um, and we were dreaming about it. AI is certainly one of the most remarkable advances that we've had of our time, and mo most recently we've seen the solutions brought to health, to education, uh, science, and so much more. And we know that the SDGs, as we frame them, are the blueprint for a much better world, a much more peaceful world, an inclusive world. Now, humanity has been debating the promises and the perils of intelligent robots since the beginning of the 20th century, and with the advent of big data. Artificial intelligence began to have an impact quite a while ago. While we may not truly have intelligent robots, yet applications for artificial intelligence, from automation to predictive analytics to smart public services, really do have a vital role to play in accelerating the achievement of our goals. At the same time, we know the risks. It can be used to widen the inequality gap, fuel discrimination and persecution, manipulate political processes, generate highly plausible false information, and disrupt the job market. Last year, the SG, in trying to respond to all the questions that were being asked of us, established a high-level panel on digital cooperation, precisely to advance the global multi-stakeholder dialogue on how we can work better together to realize the potentials of digital technologies for advancing our human well-being and mit while we mitigate the risks. Some of the recommendations of the final report that was issued this May touch upon AI. Most importantly, the panel noted that autonomous intelligence systems should be designed in intelligent ways that enable their decisions to be explained and humans to be accountable for their use. And this is really important, especially on decisions that are related to life and death. As is so often the case with technology, and perhaps mostly so now with AI, the issue lies not just in how it works, but in how it is used. For example, an AI-powered seed planting drone can turn a subsistence farmer barely able to feed her family into an entrepreneur with surplus goods. Yet a dozen of these same drones across the, the street from a larger farm could mean the loss of hundreds of jobs. So before we deploy artificial intelligence, it really is important for us to ask who it is empowering. Great care must be taken to address not only the risks of deliberate misuse, but also unintended consequences and impacts on the poor and the vulnerable. We also need to recognize the disruptive impacts and automation on employment in the world's poorest communities. In parts of sub-Saharan Africa, the loss of jobs may mean more than impact on households, but it may also mean the loss of lives. Within the UN, we see today three roles, and maybe more as we, as we journey on, that play a critical role regarding artificial intelligence. First, that we are already actively working to deploy, and in a number of cases, develop in-house applications of deep learning to allow us to work smarter, particularly in the domains of predictive and analytics. Second, through approaches such as innovation challenges and support for the creation of digital public goods, we see an opportunity to support accelerated progress 
in these areas to achieve the SDGs. And third, we have an obligation to leverage our convening power and our normative role to support the development of legal and ethical frameworks for the governance of AI on a global scale. In short, we consider the challenges and opportunities posed by AI to be central to the work that we're doing. And what I'd really like to see us do is to look at all the opportunities. And so every challenge we create 10, 20, 30 opportunities. We must, as a global continu community, continue to build on existing efforts in both public and in the private sector and accelerate responsible innovation in the areas where we already know there's a huge potential for impact. We've got less than 11 years to go. The SG just declared the decade of action. So working back from 2030, um, we should be able to make the difference that so many people have high expectations of us to do. So let's join those forces and really make that happen today for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Now comes the best part. It is my real pleasure, my honor, um, to introduce our next guest, Her Majesty Queen Rania of Jordan. Thank you, Amina, for your words and for all you do. And thank you to Ruth and to Google for bringing us together. I'm sure everyone in this room uses Google every day. But in my country, Jordan, Google has become a part of and a partner for our future. A few years ago, we had a dream of creating a platform for K-12 online learning in Arabic. Google stepped forward with funding and technical volunteers to get us from dream to reality. Today, that educational platform, Idrak, is a great example of how advanced technology can help us close seemingly impossible gaps. Technology's power to serve society is the topic that joins us today. Everything we're going to hear this afternoon begins with a remarkable fact, which is that humans, in the span of just a few years, have taught machines how to see. Experts call this technology computer vision. And every day, in laboratories, observatories, and operating rooms, it reveals more of the universe to us. The distant past, the far future, the darkest corners of the heavens, and even the deepest reaches of our minds. The UN Sustainable Development Goals are in many ways a test of our vision. They ask us to see every person on Earth all 7.7 .7 billion of us as equally deserving of justice, healthcare, education, and opportunity. And they challenge us to create a future where these rights are made real by 2030. Artificial intelligence could help us with that task. It could reveal hidden barriers to progress and help us knock them down. But before we turn computer vision toward our most human problems, before we ask artificial intelligence to help us understand poverty, malnutrition, gender inequality, or climate injustice, we must recognize another important fact, which is that our seeing machines have some worrying blind spots. Maybe you've read about the AI that analyzed years of legal data and concluded that white defendants were more deserving of mercy in a court of law or the chatbot that read Twitter and adopted the language of misogyny, or the facial recognition systems that are literally less capable of seeing a dark-skinned person as human. The tragic fact is that AI blind spot, these AI blind spots mirror our own. Machines are looking closely at the society we've built, and they're envisioning a future that looks a lot like our past. The good news is, humans can provide a corrective lens. We can create machines that not only recognize inequalities, but help us to correct them. The first step is ensuring that the teams building AI reflect all of us, men and women, 
of every color, creed, and continent. We have a long way to go. Men still outnumber women 10 to 1 in some of the most important AI research labs. The field is still mostly white, mostly male, and mostly Western. But I hope this panel shows us what change looks like. These scientists, technologists, and advocates come from different corners of the globe. They bring a range of different backgrounds and beliefs to their work. But they are united in their commitment to ensuring that AI benefits all of humanity and accelerates our progress towards achieving the, glo the global goals. So thank you, Ruth and Amina, for bringing us together and for the meaningful conversation we have in store. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I don't know about you, but I was actually really inspired by that. It's not every day that we see uh, three such powerful women uh, ruling the world and helping to introduce and welcome us to the topic today, which is how can we use technology and specifically artificial intelligence to take on the SDGs? Well, I'm Jacqueline Fuller, and I lead Google.org, which is Google's philanthropy. And our philosophy is to take the best of Google, including our funding, our technology, our Googlers, and bring that together to help solve the SDGs. And as we heard, we've got 10 years left to do that. And one of the things that we're very interested in is thinking about how we can bring the power of technology, in particular at times artificial intelligence as well, to some of these key issues like climate change and issues of the global south. Well, one way that we approached finding the best ideas in the world is earlier this year, we launched a $25 million global impact challenge where we asked everyone around the world, nonprofits, universities, social businesses, how are you using artificial intelligence and machine learning or how would you like to, to further your cause? And we were blown away by the level of response that we got and the quality of the applications. We picked 20 winners that we provided with resources and AI experts and we have two of those winners here today. So I'm gonna start by introducing them. Um, so we have, uh, um, all the way on the end, Professor Bainumogu Gisha, yes, engineer, and he is the chair of the Department of Computer Science at Makarewe University in Uganda, and he is using AI to measure air quality throughout Kampala, which he will speak about in just a minute. We welcome you here today. And here on my right, Piyandanan, who is CEO of Badwani AI, and he's applying AI to uh, causes all across India, and today is going to speak particularly about some work that they are doing in agriculture. I also want to welcome my good friend Kate Brandt, who runs sustainability at Google, and she is going to speak uh, about how we can apply technology and the lessons that we're learning when we think about the broader issues around climate, environment, and sustainability. All right, Anzan, why don't I start with you? And so you're you're, you're using technology, you come from a background in deep technology and artificial intelligence. Before we dive in and, and think about you know, specific uses of AI, I wonder if you might just take a moment for anyone in the audience who might be wondering, what the heck is artificial intelligence and machine learning? And I see some nods, I see you. And what does that really mean? Do you wanna just take a moment and, and give us a, maybe a fifth grader's explanation? Uh, as I was saying, telling Jacqueline earlier, it may be easier to explain to uh, fifth graders than to 50 year olds. Um, once upon a time, I used to be an AI professor uh, teaching undergrads at Yale University, so hopefully I remember something. Uh, see, when we think of intelligence, we think of uh, the ability to have good knowledge about the things, but most importantly, to do rational reasoning. And how do we do that? By learning about the facts and relationship between things. In that sense, artificial intelligence is no different. If we are trying to teach machines to do reasoning by learning about things in the world. But there's a key difference. 
you know, this was the, you know, here AI has a long history, about a 50-year-old modern history. But about uh, 10 years ago, we discovered some methods in machine learning, we call it deep learning, where we were able to provide large, large, large amounts of data where we gave examples. For example, in our own uh, work, we give examples of what uh, cotton pests look like. And on the outside, we had someone uh, one who said, this is this kind of pest. This is a white fly, this is a jacet, this is a bollworm. And simply give that machine the input and the output and built an architecture called deep learning, which started doing the reasoning itself. The relationship between what something looks like and what it is can be learned by the machine through a process of something called deep learning. And this has made a huge difference. We don't have to anymore write down to the rules of reasoning of what is a, you know, a cotton pest looks like. In fact, the machine is now able to train on the data and learn. And this has become really the significant breakthrough. As a result, we are all here. And as a result, we see AI applications everywhere. So we are finally having machines that are capable of learning how to reason about things based on teaching and examples. To go back to what the Her Majesty said, if we can do wrong by teaching the wrong things to the machine, but we can do better if we control how and what we teach the machine. Hope that helped. <laughs> Very okay. We got that. Quiz at the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Engineer, maybe I'll turn to you for a minute to um, describe your project that you're working on uh, that you won for in Kampala. But before we turn to you, I will just say, literally in the car yesterday, I got an email from my for former admin, Ty, um, who had moved to Uganda, had moved to Kampala, and she actually said, we're moving, we're going to go to Nairobi because the air quality is so poor. So this, you are tackling an issue that is so relevant for health, for well-being, for business and economic growth as well. Why don't you share about uh, your project? Thank you. Um, so one of the challenges that we are trying to solve using AI in Kampala at Makere University is to develop technologies that can help tackle the problem of air pollution. As we know, air pollution is an increasing uh, public health risk, as has been indicated in many reports. Uh, when we started out uh, this work in 2015, our interest then was, you know, can we find data sets that help us uh, quantify uh, the scale and the magnitude of air pollution in Kampala? And we realized that there was no any regular monitoring that was happening uh, in the city, which is true for many other African cities. And we started out, you know, together with my team and my students, uh, looking at how we can build uh, alternative low-cost technologies that can help us to address this challenge. Uh, so as a starting point, you know, we looked out what has been a traditional uh, practice in terms of uh, addressing uh, pollution and many of these traditional approaches uh, involve investment in uh, high-end hardware and software that costs a lot of money which is probably the reason why many uh, cities on the continent are not doing uh, air pollution monitoring. Uh, so together with my team we are building technologies that we deploy uh, in the city uh, if you've been to Kampala, uh, there's a popular use of uh, motorcycles that we call border borders. So we build uh, air quality monitors, uh, build it really with an understanding of the context that we work in. And we deploy these monitors uh, on motorbikes, uh, deploy them on uh, static locations in the city, and we collect data about the state of air quality in the city. At the moment, we have over uh, 50 air monitors across the city. And as we get this data in, uh, we are starting to derive insights to understand the magnitude of the pollution uh, in the city. And then applying AI to help us uh, predict and forecast how the pollution is going to be like uh, in the future. Uh, but also uh, helping us to answer important questions that can help us mitigate uh, pollution. Uh, questions like what kind of, uh, what actions lead to bigger impact uh, in improving air quality? 
So these are some of the questions we are looking at uh, using AI to address together with my team. Thank you. You know, as excited as we are about AI, and um, at Google we're pretty excited about the, the opportunities there, we also recognize that AI or machine learning may not always be um, the right tool. In fact, um, Bridget Gosling, who led our AI um, work and um, her team put together the report that's out on your seats on accelerating social good with AI, the number one lesson is that machine learning is not always the right answer. So I don't know, Anand, on engineer, how do you think about, how do you filter to understand what's the best and appropriate technology for the issues you're trying to solve? So let me begin by example of what we are doing. Um, See, we are in the great state of Maharashtra, which is one of the more progressive industrial strains, home of Mumbai, which many of you would have heard about as the financial capital of India and also the home of Bollywood. Yet, Maharashtra is also the biggest cotton growing state in India, and cotton is a very important uh, cash crop. A uh, couple of years ago, about 50% of cotton was wiped out due to two bugs uh, called American bollworm and pink bollworms. There are roughly about six to seven bugs that plague cotton year after year. And what this leads to is that crop losses that can be significant, and given the challenges, you know, on the low uh, sort of uh, technology that the farmers have, and I should mention that 70% of farmers in India and other countries in rural areas are actually smallhold farmers. They work in one acre or less of land, so it's not as if they have access to high technology, and they're not very highly educated. So these losses, once they accru you know, accrue over years, leads to financial outrip, and there were about a thousand farmers who committed suicide uh, last year in uh, Maharashtra. So there are many problems that need to be solved, but the one we identified as an important opportunity where we can actually make a difference is simply a good and robust way of counting the pest infestation. If we can measure the magnitude of infestation, then the farmers can take action. You don't want to use pesticide too soon. First of all, it's dangerous for various environmental and health reasons, but also it's expensive. So there is a thing called economic threshold limit that the agriculture experts have developed, and it's your advice to use pesticides only if that limit is reached. Yet measuring the level of infestation has been a significant challenge. How do you count the bugs? They're flying around, they have traps on which they catch, but you know, agriculture extension workers as a farmer don't always know how to recognize each of the bugs and how do you spend the time counting in the middle of all of it. So we developed an AI where you take a picture of these pest traps. This is actually a demo back in the room. And the machine learning algorithm has developed models to count the number of pests of different kinds. And that information can be reported now to the agriculture experts. There is an IT system for such reporting. And once they decide that the level of infestation is high, they can issue an advisory on when to use pesticide. So to begin with, you know, you have to understand where to apply the problem, right? So we can't just, we didn't go in thinking that pest infestation is really the thing to work. We talked to the agriculture department and officials and understood how the cotton growing cascade works and discovered that this is a place where we can apply. But we also know that this information can be used in the advice giving process. So you have to have a good problem that you know is important, and you also have to a way of taking it to the end to be useful. So. All right, let's 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 turn uh, the pivot a little bit to climate, one of the hot topics of the week, haha. -ha. And Kate, from your vantage point, I mean, Kate is Google's chief sustainability officer. She's also um, played that role for the federal government as well. So from your perspective, what are you seeing that you're excited about in terms of applying technology to climate? Yeah, I think that we're seeing some tremendous opportunity for climate um, around unlocking data, visualizing data, utilizing cloud computing. So I'll share just a few of my favorite examples. And the first is actually, if you had the chance to walk around before we sat down for the session, um, you can check it out in the back. It's a tool called the Environmental Insights Explorer. So this is a tool that our team partnered with the Global Covenant of Mayors on last year. Uh, and the reason that we really wanted to focus in on cities is, as you may know, about 80% of emissions globally are coming from cities. So if we can support cities, enable cities to assess their carbon footprint, to set climate action plans, this can have a huge positive impact. 
So what we did with the Global Covenant of Mayors is we looked at what were some of the unique data sets that Google has that we could unlock and make available. And so the first one is a transportation data set. And so what you'll see if you get into the tool back there is that we were able to show the transportation carbon footprint within a city and also get into some details like mode share, the amount of vehicles coming in and out of a city during the day. We also have building emissions data. We have data around the solar potential of rooftops in a city. And in fact, we already saw uh, one of our cities just down the road where, from where I am in California, in San Jose, they were working on their climate action plan and they knew, hey, we have a lot of sunshine. They wanted to set an aggressive solar target. So they used our tool to assess the solar potential of all of their rooftops. And then they were able to say, hey, we feel confident in setting a one gigawatt solar target. And they credited our tool with giving them the confidence to do that. So that's one of, the, one of my favorite examples. Another one is uh, Project Airview, which is actually very similar to the wonderful work that the professor and his team are doing in Kampala. So in, with Project Airview, our team has been taking air quality sensors that can measure NOx, SOx, particulate matter, CO2, black carbon, and putting those air quality sensors on some of our street view cars. So you may have perhaps seen these cars driving around. Uh, these are the cars that make Google Maps, Google Street View possible. But on a few of them, we've attached these air quality sensors. And so in three communities around California, and now also in London, and Copenhagen, and Amsterdam, we're able to collect highly localized air quality data. So we can show on a street by street level, where are the hot spots in a city? And it's often in some of the most vulnerable communities where we see the worst air quality. So by making this data available, cities can begin to address that. And then the last example I would share um, is very much related to our topic of AI and machine learning, which is Global Fishing Watch. So in this case, we're sort of zooming out from the city scale to a global scale, and in this case, thinking about fisheries management. Uh, and so what we were able to do is partner with two NGOs, Oceana and SkyTruth, and take a global data set, which is called the Automatic Identification System. Basically what this is, this is a public data set. Any ship at the high sea constantly has to be pinging out their location via GPS. And so what the team did is they trained a machine learning algorithm to understand what did a fishing boat look like as opposed to a tug or a tanker or a sailboat, and then actually what it looked like when it was fishing. And then off the back of that machine learning, as well as the power of cloud computing, we were able to create this global, real-time map of fishing activity. And so what communities and governments have been able to do is use that data to create five new marine protected areas. And so they're able to enable fisher fishermen to be in the places where they should, but also protect the fisheries and steward them. So just a couple of my favorite examples. Let's, let's stay with you, Kate, for just a second, because I think one thing that's been so positive is just this sort of growing wave in energy coming, especially from young people who are saying, how can I be part of the solution around climate change? And, you know, what can I do? So you talked about a lot of great examples at sort of the corporate and city levels. What can individuals do? Absolutely. And so another one of our favorite tools that you may have seen in the back is geared at exactly this. It's called Your Plan, Your Planet. And our awesome team at Google, Jill Puente, who's here in the audience with us, um, as well as our local science museum back in the Bay Area, the California Academy of Sciences, we came together and asked ourselves this exact question. People are constantly asking us, what can I do in my daily life? I want to have a positive impact, but I don't know where to start. So we basically started with the three core areas where we have impact on the planet. How we use energy, how we use water, and our consumption of food and food waste. And so what we did is we went out to a bunch of experts and we came up with a set of science-based tips and tricks that anyone can use at home. So a couple of my favorite ones that I learned through the building of this tool um, are on the topic of water. Actually, if you can not hand wash your dishes, but put them in the dishwasher, you will save a bunch of water and save yourself a bunch of time. So that's a good one. Um, another one that I recently did at home is your hot water heater. Your hot water heater is a big energy hog. And so if you can turn that hot water heater down just five or 10 degrees, you'll still get a really nice hot shower, but you actually also can save yourself a lot of energy. So those are just a few of the kinds of tips that are in that tool. 
A couple of other great examples, I think, of things that you know we're trying to enable people to do in their daily lives are Google Maps. You know, we all, many of us use Google Maps every day. But one of the great things about Maps is it shows us the best way to walk, so we could walk instead of getting in a car. Equally, public transportation making it much easier to guide your public transportation routes. So that's a big one. And then we've started layering in things like EV charging. So if you drive an electric vehicle, you can see in Maps where can you plug in that vehicle. And then the last one I would share is the Nest Learning Thermostat. We, uh, we were crunching a bunch of numbers to publish our annual environmental report recently. Um, and what we saw was that in 2018 alone, our Nest customers, they saved more energy than Google used in 2018. So that's another great tip that folks can look at. You know, um, you know, I mentioned as, as a technology company, you know, Google is uh, so optimistic about the power of technology. We want to help leverage that, bring it into the sector. But I think Her Majesty Queen Rania, as well as Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed, both raised the fact that we need to also weigh the risks and understand any potential blind spots that come with AI and other advanced technologies. So at Google, we've developed our responsible AI principles that we apply to all of our products and everything that we take on. But how do you think about the risks inherent or some of the blind spots um, or biases that may be present in the kinds of data sets and technologies that you all use? I'll just open that to the panel. Uh, so. I think you know any domain. I mean, first of all, as uh, you know, Hamaja has well pointed out, much of the problem with uh, bad AI is how it's taught, wh who it's learning from, and what it's learning. Right. So if you don't have enough of a sampling of the distribution of the real world, or if you don't have the kind, right kind of classification or labeling, that's what the machine is going to learn. It's going to learn what you teach. Teach. The second place where there is a risk is actually with respect to being able to understand and control what the machine does. When we, you know, somebody does a reasoning, we ask them to explain it and they'll tell you. Many times, these AI algorithms are a bit like magic. How do I know, open it up and understand exactly what is going on so that I can actually, you know, understand where things are not doing the right thing? There is a lot of effort, you know, today in creating transparent AI, fair AI, and explainable AI. And these are things that are still uh, you know, in progress that will have to be uh, done. But what we found in our own, you know, work is that when you understand, when you have a very specific goal, such as pest measurement or whatever, uh, the problem is a little bit easier because in order for you to succeed, you're going to have to get the right sampling. And there are people who have been working on this problem hard for a long time without the help of these technologies that kind of understand what is the nature of these kind of infestations. So. Most important thing is to make sure that the data that you collect correctly represents the distribution of the problem, and, and in fact, the right kind of teaching is done. Yeah, so one of the you know, strategies of dealing with this bias uh, from my experience is, uh, you know, uh, comes from understanding of the, of the local context and where this data is being collected from. And from my experience, uh, we see that, uh, you know, working with the, let's say the local people, I will give an example for the uh, pollution data uh, collection. Uh, once we put these sensors uh, on the motorbikes, we realize that, uh, you know, we have privacy issues to deal with, uh, which we, we are not aware um, you know, at the start, but when you uh, understand how uh, these motorbike riders move around, uh, you get to understand uh, some of the, you know, the risks uh, that come with the data that you collect. So I think the key are uh, important is uh, how we collect this data. I think the local context is very important, and most importantly, involving the uh, people who are actually affected uh, by the decisions that this data, uh, you know, it might lead to. That's what I could share. Thank you. You know, we, we hear a lot of conversation um, at UN Week. In fact, I think we could play bingo with how many times people say partnership and 
collaboration and multi-sectoral, and we all know that um, and SDG 17 is so important, we need to partner, but sometimes it's just so darn hard. And uh, there's so much, within Google, we have this issue even just coordinating with ourselves, and we call it coordination headwinds. Um, so we know partnership is so important, and yet at the other t end, it can be so hard. I'm just wondering if any of you have discovered some hacks that have been helpful in your careers, in your work, to bring together, I mean, Anand and I know we were speaking at break about, over lunch, about working with a government, and it's so important, and yet it's so hard. But so any, any hacks or insights that you all have had? See, in, in social sector, see, in commercial sector, uh, the producers of technology directly work with uh, customers. I mean, you sell your products to the customers. And as long as you have a good uh, application that solves a problem, you can find the market. But in social sector, it doesn't work that way because most of the caregiving is done through government programs and other social sector organizations who tend to be either adversely you know, oriented toward technology or not aware of it. So the first thing that you have to do really is, it, it, it's an ironically, it splits, the world splits into two parts. Those who own the problems, which are typically governments and social sector organizations and are providing the ground service and they've been doing this for years and years. And those who own the solutions, which are technology people like us and Google and so on. And there is a gap between these two. So the first thing we discovered is really to start with the problem owners, not with the solutions. Start by talking to the agricultural ministry, agriculture extension programs, or other NGOs and companies that are involved in providing the service. You sp speak to them, go with them uh, to the villages, to the farmers, and you spend some time learning. One very, very helpful um, you know, group that in this, in this is actually donor organizations, both you know, big you know, individual donor companies as well as UN and other organizations that have been uh, helping or uh, supporting not-for-profits and they tell you which not-for-profits have been doing well and which ones to trust and you talk to them. And you really identified at least, identify at least one or two partners and one or two government programs that work. I mean, governments vary a lot, state to state, uh, region to region. So you want to start with states where there is, you have the confidence that the government programs will be work. And, and you start with them and learn the problem from them. And then when you build the solution, you want to make sure that they have a stake in it. They are helping you co-create. When you do usability test, go with them. You can't go alone and get anything done because ultimately the solutions have to flow into the system and scaling can only be done by government programs at this point in social domain. Yeah, I would add to that. I think for us, we've had great success in bringing together a diverse set of partners with a variety of skill sets. So, you know, we know what we can bring to the table is our technical know-how, cloud computing, machine learning, um, but there are others who will know these ecological systems much better than we do or the communities much better than we do. Um, and equally, you know, what we've also found is you can build. So one of my favorite examples that's um, entirely related to SDG 6 is around global surface water. You know, we knew we had a really great data set in our tool called Earth Engine about um, all global fresh water and change over time. But we weren't really sure how to unlock this, how to make it useful. So first we partnered with the European Joint Research Commission and they helped us make our sort of first of a kind tool to help policymakers see this change over time. But then we started talking to the UN Environment Program and they said, you know what, this could be great for tracking of SDG 6. And so then by bringing them in, we were able to make this data even more useful, unlock new insights, and now it's becoming the app that Ruth mentioned briefly at the beginning that policymakers are able to use to drive their water policies and drive action on SDG 6. So that diverse set of partners continuing to expand who's engaged has been really successful for us. Yeah, I think from our experience, the biggest challenge, uh, you know, with doing AI projects is, uh, you know, many times you, you're doing projects that cross boundaries uh, of specific disciplines and also organizations. And we found that, uh, especially at the start, it's really difficult to get your hands on data sets that these organizations already have. And we've taken, you know, different approaches. Uh, one is to really build relationships with these organizations. And then, as, you know, my colleagues have uh, mentioned, uh, then uh, trying to find out, uh, you know, one specific issue 
that they are really uh, grappling with and then try to answer that question using AI and then go and demonstrate. Uh, and usually after that demonstration, they see the potential and it makes the collaboration uh, much smoother uh, going forward. And I think sometimes part of the problem is, is us on the funding side. Right? I think funders don't give the proper incentives or don't provide the resources for the knowledge sharing. And we were having a funny moment actually just off stage um, where you two were discovering that you have a shared pest. And uh, uh, the, was it the white fly? The white fly. Yeah. And, uh, but you know, if you had a, a, maybe from our impact challenge winners, if you had a message for funders about what we need to do differently to help you do your job more effectively, what would your message be for us? See, the main, I mean, it's a very good point, actually. We are lucky in that, that we have a founder donors who have committed, uh, the Wadwani brothers, who committed $3 million a year for 10 years. And without that, I wouldn't be able to get to a point that Google finds, you know, what we do interesting. But the key is a lot of social sector funding, either it's from CSR funding from companies or, you know, donations, typically go towards programs. They go towards implementation on the ground, distributing vaccines or, you know, giving out uh, various kind of pesticides and so on. R&D funding is extremely limited. In fact, most donors, traditional donors, don't understand what it means to do R&D funding, what does it mean to take the risk. And this is exactly why Google's, you know, AI impact challenge is extremely helpful. And I think more funding for innovation to de-risk while actually working in collaboration is extremely important. I think we need to see more organizations that are willing to provide, you know, provide R&D funding to do the risk mitigation. Professor, this is your moment. <laughs> yeah, so I think, uh, you know, what is really important is that uh, we need to encourage uh, multi or cross-disciplinary uh, projects and projects that, uh, you know, talking uh, for universities, at projects that uh, go beyond academic uh, impact and encourage collaboration with uh, other sectors. And I think the other important aspect is the also encouraging, uh, you know, grantees and other, you know, players in the space of AI uh, to put in effort in creating data sets that could be used by other uh, organizations and individuals. Well, um, this week I think highlights all of the challenges that we have ahead of us. And I think sometimes I've gone to some of these sessions and you hear the statistics and, you know, we have come so far um, and we can be really proud of some of the progress that's been made and yet we have so far to go. So maybe in closing, just a personal question, which is as you face the challenges in your day-to-day -day work, and as you face the challenges in solving these issues with air pollution or agriculture for the poorest um, and the most vulnerable people around the world, as you think about reversing the really scary trends in climate change, where do you go for inspiration personally? Kate, do you want to start? Absolutely. I, I think for me, my inspiration comes from the incredible people who are so impact driven and driving this all of this amazing work. So, you know, my distinguished panelists, all your amazing impact challenge winners, and frankly, everyone else who applied to, you know, I had the honor of reviewing all the folks in our sustainability space and just the number of people out there who are devoting their time, that are devoting their professional careers to driving change is so powerful. And I feel really honored at Google to get to work with a lot of people like that. Um, and the thing that I always say that I, I feel like makes um, our culture is so special is we have this really cool thing called 20% projects where any employee can work with their manager and say, I wanna carve out 20% of my time to work on something different, to work on something impactful or anything that you might like. Um, and some of our best tools and our best work have come out of that. And, and just one of my favorite examples is my friend Carl Elkin who lives up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, he wanted to put solar panels on his roof. You know, he wanted to take action at home and do his part, but he didn't really know, did his, did his roof get enough sunshine? How, you know, how would he go about doing that? 
and he thought to himself, I bet that Google Earth actually has this information if we could just tease that out. And so I, I mentioned a moment ago um, the data that we've given cities to assess solar potential, but that actually started with a tool called Project Sunroof that came out of Carl's 20% project that took this Google Earth data set and made it so um, you can Google in the tool your home address and see if your roof is a good candidate for solar. So it's folks like our panelists here and Carl and many others that keep me inspired every day. I, I would say similar to what she said. I think the problem owners, I, I know being in India, one of the reasons you know we I, I moved back to India to do this is because unless you're close to the problem, uh, you won't know what to do and you won't do the right thing. But then once you start visiting farmers together with the NGOs and government officers that are helping them. Once you go to see expecting mothers in rural areas uh, and understand the conditions that they are uh, facing, your uh, perspective changes and it's extremely inspiring because these are people, uh, the mainstream AI that we all talk about, we all use, doesn't apply to about three billion people in the world. They, their lives are not affected by self driverless cars or even Google search for that matter, which is probably one of the more widely used products. Uh, WhatsApp is probably the other one. So yet, you know, that kind of AI is not reaching their life. So when you talk to them, you get inspired. You feel like, hey, this is more important and I know if I do this, there are people who are willing to be patient and take it and they will help you. If you ask them to go collect data, they'll do it for you. Most of our data collection was done by farmers and agriculture extension workers on a purely voluntary basis. So you really talk to the problem owners. Yeah, for me, really the the desire to create technology solutions that can impact on human lives uh, keeps me going. Uh, when I returned to Uganda after spending six years in Europe uh, for my grad school, uh, one of the key things that uh, motivated me to go back to Uganda uh, was the opportunity to use uh, technology to create solutions that have potential for impact. And, you know, having uh, been in the context where you clearly see uh, lack of resources, of lack of efficiency in many sectors, uh, this creates, uh, you know, a great desire to continue working hard uh, to see that, you know, we can create solutions that can help either compensate for lack of the resources or improve efficiency in the different processes. Someone told me today at a dinner um, that knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit and wisdom is knowing not to put that into a fruit salad. <laughs> so if you were going to leave our audience with one word of wisdom today, what would that be? Uh, AI, as great as a technology is, it is not the panacea. It's really one that can amplify human effort. And the more you align your work with human effort, the better you can do. I think for me it would be to, to stay hopeful, to know that the challenges are great, but that we have the tools to solve them together and that it's all about working together and driving toward that change. Yeah, for me really to know that every individual has a role to play uh, in helping us uh, achieve the uh, development goals. And, you know, in whatever capacity we are in, knowing that, you know, there's that one small task which we can all do individually and can lead, can lead to a bigger positive change that we want to see. Well, why don't you join me in thanking um, Engineer Kate and Anandan for the work that they're doing, how they've chosen to invest their lives into driving these solutions and for taking time to speak with us today. Let's give them a round of applause. And if you haven't yet had a moment to visit the demos in the back, you can see some of the work that was mentioned today uh, live and interact with some of the data um, there. So thanks again on behalf of Google.org for joining today. Thank you.